1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're going to be tonight. Um, we're going to be picking up in verse 13. Um, and and uh, let's, just, let's just jump. Let's just read verse 13. We'll just jump right in tonight. Paul is writing, obviously, to the Thessalonians. He says, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. So Paul here, as he's writing to this, is still early in this letter to the Thessalonians, and he uh, thanks God for how the Th Thessalonians had received the message. And when, when, when Paul and Silas had preached, the people had recognized the words as, as being more than just human ideas. They sensed that there was something more going on here. Paul and his companions were the immediate source of the message. They were the ones speaking it. But the Thessalonians recognized that Paul and his companions were nothing more than intermediaries. They were just the spokesperson, the, the middleman in between. And they were just proclaiming a message whose source was God himself. And, and this gospel message revealed its divine origin and pay, power as it transformed people's lives. You know, that's one of the, the greatest measures, one of the greatest ways we can see the power of the message of the gospel is, is not <clears throat> in, you know, how many people we see in a church or anything, but it's, it's changed lives. It's, the, it's that over, here we are nearly 2,000 years later, and there are still lives being changed. There's still transformation that takes place. And, and the, the message of the gospel is still, even today, it's still the very word of God. Not one word has changed. It's still not a message that comes from men. It is the very word of God. And we still see the power of God, uh, the power of the gospel to transform lives. We look around us, you know, like here, even in this room, we look around and we see lives that have been changed by the gospel. And, and we can still hear the voice of God speaking to us through His Word. It's just a miracle, the, the, the miraculous thing. And you know, when, when we go to church, whether it's here or where you're listening to some uh, preacher of the Word on, on television or watching him or something like that, when we listen to a preacher of the Word of God, now not every preacher preaches the Word of God. Uh, there are some out there that preach their own ideas. Uh, but, but when you listen to a preacher that's preaching the Word of God, one of the things that we should pray is that we would hear the voice of God in the voice of the preacher. Another way of saying it is saying, Lord, help me hear what you're saying to me through this Word right now. Because, you know, it's really easy to get caught up in that whole, uh, you know, oh, boy, I wish so-and-so were here today. They really needed this. You know, have you ever heard somebody say something like that? Maybe you've been tempted to say something like that. And, and it may be true that they really needed it. But if we're constantly thinking about who else needs to hear from the Word of God, then what happens is we miss out on what God's trying to say to us through that. And so we have to be constantly in prayer and just and realize that, that God can speak through anybody. You know, it's, it's not, it's not that, a, that a, piece, a preacher or a pastor is somebody special or anything. I mean, my goodness, in the Old Testament, God spoke through a donkey one time. So, you know, that makes me realize I'm not that special. You know, if he can use a donkey, he could probably use me. And, uh, but, but, but if whoever it is, we, we can look to God and we can ask him and say, Lord, help me to hear your voice. D d d if, and if they're saying things that are off, that are wrong... You can, even in the middle of that, you can say, Lord, help me to be able to sift through all of this. I don't want to hear a man's opinion. Help me hear what you're saying to me. And, and the Thessalonians received the word of God that way. They said, this is the word of God to us. And they, they were experiencing how the word, word of God continues to work in those who believe. The, the word that's translated at work in this verse that we just read, it's almost always used in the New Testament uh, of some form of supernatural activity. Mostly it refers to the activity of God, but occasionally it even refers to that of Satan. But, it, uh, but it's, it's in every case, it speaks of a force that's not human, that's involved. And here in this case, it draws attention to the fact that the power manifested in the lives of the believers 
is not of this world, but it is divine power. Um, and, and wherever the word of God is welcomed with obedient faith, there the power of God is at work. If you want to know if God's at work in your power, you just have to ask yourself, am I receiving what he says to me with obedient faith? Am I doing what he calls me to do and doing it as an act of faith? If I'm doing that, then his power is at work in me. And, and he's helping me grow. He's changing me. But it's, you know, it's like, uh, listen, watching, gauging your own spiritual growth, it's, <clears throat> and every parent here will understand this, it's a lot like watching your own children grow. You don't, you don't see the growth. You don't notice the growth. You know, you can measure it, but you don't see it. And then you go to visit somebody, you know, you haven't seen for a while, and then they make a comment like, Oh my goodness, your kids are huge. And then you look at your kids and you're like, huh, you know what, they are. When did that happen? Because the growth happens so slowly, you don't see it. But then over time, you can measure it. And that's what we can do. We, if we will respond to his word with obedient faith, then we know his power is at work in us. He said in another place that he will be faithful to complete the work that he started. And, and so uh, as long as I respond that way, I know I'm growing. And then later down the road, it might be months, it might be years, but I can look back and I'll be able to see, I'll be able to measure how far I've come. I'll be able to see that there is growth there. And when he speaks here of believing, Paul uses a, a present tense word to convey the idea of continuous belief uh, rather than another form of, word, of the word that was available that would, have, that would single out the act of decision. And what that says to me that is that growing in Christ and the, just like these Thessalonians believers were doing, it's, it's not about this one moment where they pray a prayer and they say, okay, I believe in Jesus, and then that's it. But it's about a continual process of believing, uh, that a continual process of putting my faith in Him. In, in order to experience the working of God in our lives, we have to continue to exercise faith. It's not enough to have said that you believe at one point in your life. But the New Testament makes it clear over and over and over and over again that you must live out your faith as a continuing exercise of belief. It's what James talked about. You read the book of James, his whole uh, letter is about making sure that if you say you have faith, that it shows up in your life, that you're living it out. Because if you're not living your faith, then he says it's a dead faith. And, and that's the idea that's, that's here in this. Uh, another way you can put it, I don't, I've heard this before, maybe I don't know where it came from, but, but another way to say it is this, we cannot live today on the spiritual capital of yesterday. What God did in my life yesterday, a week ago, last year, at summer camp, you know, at a conference, that's not good enough. That's not what I need now. That got me to where I am now, but it's not going to keep me moving forward. I have to continually work and respond to His Spirit and keep moving forward. Let's read verse 14, all the way through 16. For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Um, one evidence of the continual work of, of the Word of God in the Thessalonians was, that, uh, was their fortitude when they suffered persecution. They were willing to go the distance for Christ, even if it meant persecution, pain, and suffering. And, and frankly, the only possible ex explanation for that kind of a transformation was the power of God at work in them. It certainly wasn't Paul's work or his discipleship program because he got ran out of town before he could finish what he wanted to do. His time with them was short. That's why he was concerned about them. That's one of the reasons we're going to be talking a little bit more about that t tonight that he, he sent Timothy and he was worried that all his work there was going to be lost, that they would lose their faith, that they walk away from Christ. 
but, but even with suffering, even with persecution, they still were not quitting. They weren't giving up. They were still pressing forward with Christ. And the, and, and the only way that happens is when we are completely changed on the inside. That's an evidence of the power of God at work in our lives. And, and he says that in enduring that, the, that persecution that they were dealing with, the believers in Thessalonica had actually imitated, he said, the believers of, in God's churches in Judea. Now, I want to make it clear. They had not planned this imitation. They, they hadn't consciously and intentionally got together and said, okay, how can we copy the lifestyle of those original Christians in Judea? Somebody, somebody traveled down there and find out what they're doing and let us know how we can do the same thing here. That's not what happened. Um, rather, what Paul did is he, he observed parallels between the circumstances and the responses of both the original Judean Christians and the recent Macedonian Christians. Um, and, and let me just say this as well. The reason there were similarities is because it was the same spirit at work in both of them. That was the commonality there. They came, the, 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 the Jewish believers down in, in Israel, uh, they came from a completely different culture, different worldview. They were different people altogether than the Macedonians there in, in Thessalonica. Yet their response was the same. Why is that? It's because it was the same spirit giving them the strength to keep moving forward. So what were some of the parallels that Paul noticed? Well, first of all, he said both were suffering persecution from their own countrymen. Just as the Jewish believers in Judea had been harassed and hunted by fellow Jews, then these Gentile believers in Thessalonica had been picked on and persecuted by their friends and neighbors. Second parallel was that both were suffering for the same thing. They were churches of God in Christ Jesus, totally committed to the one true God who had revealed himself through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And by, by receiving that message of the cross and the resurrection, the Thessalonians had aligned themselves with other like-minded believers around the world. And in doing so, they drew the ire of the enemies of Christ and the gospel, just like they did in Jerusalem. And then the third parallel and this is the one that really matters, uh, significant, it's very significant, and that is that they, both of them were suffering with endurance. They, they didn't cave in under the persecution, even when it became violent. Instead, they endured hardship, exhibiting works of faith and hope and, and love in the midst of suffering. And, and listen, frankly, I think everybody here knows it would have been easy to simply surrender to the pressure and the pain around them. But instead, just like their Jewish counterparts in Judea, the believers in Macedonia held their ground. And then in this verse, Paul referred to the Jews causing all kinds of persecution. But this, this verse and verses like this have been twisted by people and they've ter turned them into anti-Semitic uh, viewpoints. But that's not what Paul is saying. It's important to realize that he's not talking about all the Jews. He's speaking specifically of specific Jews who were opposing his preaching the gospel. He didn't mean all Jews. After all, Paul himself was a Jew. And all of the uh, first Christians were all Jewish. So he's not saying, he's not trying to paint a broad br with a broad brush, brush and say, all the Jews are out to get the Christians. That's not what he was saying at all. Uh, but Paul knows... And the reason he knows this is because he himself was part of this movement, but he knows that within Judea, many Jews had been bitterly opposed to Jesus before his death and resurrection. And then they were also bitterly opposed to the groups that sprang up after his resurrection, hailing Jesus as Messiah and Lord. And, and frankly, I, I really, you know, now you understand in the Greek, there's no punctuation. There's no, there are no commas, things like that. Okay. So the NIV, when it translated that, that verse, verse 14, going into verse 15, it says, you suffered from your own countrymen, the same thing those churches suffered from the Jews. And they put a comma there, who killed the Lord Jesus. I, that comma, I don't believe should be there because he's not saying the Jews as a whole who killed the Lord Jesus. What he's saying is uh, that they suffered the same thing as the Jewish believers did from 
the Jews who killed Jesus. Specifically, those Jews who killed Jesus. You see, there's a difference there. And, and, and he said, uh, and, the, and also killed the prophets and drove the, him out as well. So the question is, and I think this is a good question. Why were these Jewish people who were opposed, because not all of them were opposed, there were many believers who were Jewish, but why were they so hostile to Christianity? Um, and we know that they're hostile. The, the Jewish people had a history of killing their own prophets. Jesus had said to the Jewish leaders of his day, speaking of the past and predicting what they would do in, uh, to his followers in the future. Listen to some of these things he said. These are all from Matthew 23. These are all Jesus speaking. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build t- tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. But then go down to verse 13. So you testify against yourselves, excuse me, verse 31. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Then verse 34. Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue them from, uh, pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of, the, of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. And then in verse 37, Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. So what Paul, what, what Jesus did there, but also what Paul is doing when he, when he said, he, he said, uh, the Jews who killed Jesus, but also those who killed the prophets and who drove me out. What he's doing is he's establishing a pattern of behavior among many of the Jewish people. They they should have recognized Jesus as the Messiah. Instead, they crucified him. They should have recognized God's messengers, the prophets, and obeyed the word of the Lord that was delivered through them. But instead, they killed many of them. And then, and think about this. They should have recognized the power of the gospel when Paul, who a known persecutor of the church, uh, and, and, and I mean, a uh, rabid persecutor of the church, he suddenly becomes an ardent follower of Christ. Now, have you ever thought about that? They, somebody, it should have caused them to pause for a minute and say, wait a minute, this guy... Was, as a, was against more against Jesus than anybody else we know. He was persecuting, he was rounding them up, throwing them into prison. He stood uh, and gave, uh, 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 gave uh, permission, in a sense, to the crowd that stoned Stephen, one of the first deacons of the church. And now all of a sudden, he's preaching this same Jesus? Somebody, it should have caused somebody to pause and say, wait a minute, how can a... How can a person change that drastically? And so it should have pointed to the power of the gospel for them to say, wait a minute, we need to re-examine this whole Jesus thing. But instead, what did they do? They drove him out and they wanted to kill him. They tried to kill him multiple times. They just couldn't get it done. So uh, this Jewish opposition was there, but it continued after Jesus' death and resurrection. And why? Well, the first thing was, the Jewish leaders feared that if very many Jews were drawn away into Christianity, then their position of power, their political position might be weakened. You know, often, you know, it's kind of, let me just relate it to the church world. When you hear about church problems, you know, a church split or something like that, I'm here to tell you, whatever the issue is, it's not the issue. You know, for example, uh, you know, maybe you've heard, I haven't heard one for like this for a long time, but it can be really something really petty where a church splits over choosing the color of the new carpet. Well, here's the thing. It was never about the color of the carpet. It was about who gets to choose what color the carpet's going to be. It was about the power. Who's going to have the power to make the choices? And it's the same thing here 
this is one of the things that blinded these Jewish leaders back in the first century because they, they, they would not consider what Jesus was saying and his message and what, who he was and what he did because to do so would, would, uh, would bring their position down. Uh, and they believe passionately that, well, and, and part of that is because they were very proud of their special status as God's chosen people. So the message of Jesus and the gospel was going out to Gentiles. That really got on their nerves because they believed that God's salvation was for them as Jews only. They, they, and they, and they, regarded as blasphemous the message of a crucified Messiah who offered salvation on equal terms to Gentiles as well. See, they misunderstood. God had chosen them as his people, but, but they misunderstood. God clearly had said all throughout the Old Testament that they were to be a light in, to the nations, that they were supposed to let the world see the glories of the, of the God of Israel. And, and that was what they were supposed to do. But instead, they become, became proud that they were chosen by God and assumed that that meant that they were the only ones chosen by God and everybody else was a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners and they needed to stay out there and stay away from us. As the people who should have recognized the Messiah and, and, and if they had listened to the message of God as to why they were chosen, they should have welcomed all who would come to the one true God. They should have been happy about all the nations coming to God and, and, and being considered loved by God. But they failed miserably, miserably at that and actually feared that others might find salvation because then it would diminish their special role in their mind. Paul said that they were hostile to all men. What does that mean? In their rejection, because I mean, I don't think he's saying that they just literally hate everybody, but in their rejection of Jesus and in their persecution of Jesus's people and the church, they were trying to hinder the gospel message by which all people of every nation could be saved. So if you're opposing the gospel, that is an act of hostility to all people to all nations. Holding back the progress of the gospel is clearly a serious crime. It's a serious sin against uh, humankind. And we, we shouldn't be surprised if the consequences are severe. And Paul says that by doing this, they continue to heap up their sins to the limit. They, the picture there is, a, is of a cup that's getting full and it's about to overflow. That's the picture that he's, that he's given to there. Uh, the, 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 the opposition to God was, uh, was another in a long series of rebellions and, and that was building up their guilt for the time when God's punishment would overflow, God's punishment would be revealed. And in fact, it's very interesting. It's, it's hard to really understand completely, but Paul, at the end of that verse, those passage, he talks about it even using past tense, which we do know that Paul did it multiple times things that, he's, that he considered to be so certain, even though they hadn't fully happened yet, he would use a past tense and say it had happened. For example, he would talk about our salvation as being done, but it's not done. It's not done because our bodies haven't been redeemed yet. Um, but it's so certain it's going to happen that he uses past tense. And Paul is just convinced that, that this Jewish opposition to the gospel was just, go, was just storing up the wrath of God for them and it was going to overflow and, and they were going to uh, have the, face the inevitable consequences uh, and, that, and that would be the anger of God. Now, I want to say this about God's anger because a lot of people think God is an angry God. He's just out there. You do something wrong, he's ready to zap you. You know, you know step out of line, gotcha! I smash you like a bug. You know, that's not God. God's anger is never capricious, which means, you know, there's always a reason. There's a purpose behind it. And his anger is never malevolent. It's never angry. Uh, well, it's not angry. That's not the right word. It's never uh, intentionally harsh and mean. But when humans reject him and they behave in ways that undermine his wise and generous designs for them in the world... He, 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 here's the thing about his anger. He does not instantly punish. Why? 
because he allows space for repentance. And if repentance does not happen, then wickedness builds up, sin accumulates until the point comes where God must say enough and bring things to an end. This, according to Genesis 15, 16, is what happened with the Canaanites. It's what happens, you read about the Amalekites. People say, why did God say you got to wipe out the Amalekites? Well, God gave them uh, hundreds, 400 years and more to repent. And they still refused to repent. And God finally said, okay, it's enough. So it wasn't like a capricious moment where God says, okay, let's, I'm going to get him now because I'm just mad. I don't like him. That's, that never happened. God always, before judgment came, always, always, always gives people a chance and gives them room to be able to repent. He does that in our lives. Because listen, if he didn't do that, then I'd be in trouble. Any, let, let me just take a little survey. How many of you in this past week, in one way or another, whether through action or attitude, have sinned? Okay, my hand's up as well. If, God, if God's anger, uh, you know, was instant punishment, what's the wages of sin? Yeah. Death. Guess where we'd all be? Yeah. Right. We'd be in big trouble. But God gives us space for repentance. He gives us time. He deals with us. He calls us. He says, don't go this way. You know, you need to turn around. That's what repentance means. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of actions. And so he says, he gives us the time and the space for that. And, and, uh, but if we don't do it, then eventually the anger of God will overflow. And I'm not going to get into it tonight, but Romans chapter 1 is all about the wrath of God being poured out. And I'll just say this about that. Romans 1 tells us it's not what we think when God's wrath is poured out because we tend to think of, you know, acts of God. You know, the wrath of God is like earthquakes and, you know, volcanoes and tornadoes and all these things that, you know, lightning bolts from the sky, God's punishment. But according to Romans chapter 1, God's wrath is poured out. How is it done? It's done when he set, reaches a point where he says, all right, you, you insist on, on embracing your sin. I'm going to pour out my wrath by letting you have your sin. And your sin is going to bring destruction to your life. I'm going to just turn you over to it. That's the wrath of God. And uh, now Paul writing these things about the Jews, it was very difficult for him. There were difficult words for him. He is a Jew from, from birth. To write, uh, he's writing this about his countrymen. He cared about his nation. He wanted them saved. Paul understood that the Jews were God's chosen people, and and he knew that many of them would come to salvation. But he also knew that many would just flatly reject the truth and never give Jesus a chance. And that pained him so greatly, especially uh, when those Jews were attacking him outright. In, in another letter in Romans, Paul wrote this in Romans ten one, dear brothers and sisters. The longing of my heart and my prayer to God is that the Jewish people might be saved. And then in, in Romans 9, 2 through 4, he said, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. That is a powerful statement. Why? For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. He said, if I could, now he's, he can't. He said, if I can make a deal and say, God, send me to hell for eternity and you save all the rest of the Jews. He said, I'd do it. That's in essence what he's saying. Now, that's not a deal that can be made because every person's accountable for their own actions. But that's what he's saying. So we, we see that Paul was deeply grieved that there were Jewish people who were not receiving the truth. So what's happening here when Paul is saying these things, it's not Paul pronouncing some judgment and invoking dire disasters and gloating over that and saying, God's going to get him. You know, it's going to be a great day when God wipes out all these, these evil people. But what he is doing, he's grieving over the effects of their own sins. It's a big difference. And it's something that we need to emulate. Let's go on to verse 17. But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. 
Certainly I, Paul did again and again, but Satan stopped us. Very interesting things here in this, this passage here. Uh, Paul, Paul's accusers had pointed out the sudden departure of the missionaries and the fact that they, they had not soon returned. And they were implying to the believers there in Thessalonica that Paul and Silas had lied to them and that they were just too scared to, to come back. They said, oh, they're just cheating you. That's why they ran out of town. They're, and they're, they're, they're not coming back because they're too afraid. In fact, the missionaries did not separate themselves from the Thessalonian believers. They were separated from the Thessalonians by force, in a way. Uh, the, the word translated torn away literally means, get this, it literally means, Paul said, we were orphaned from you. We were orphaned. Now, this seems odd to us because, you know, Paul is more like the father figure and, and he, he's talking in these terms, but, but we have this modern understanding of being orphaned. But in, in, in Greek literature, the word translated here, it is when it's talking about being orphaned, it use, is used primarily to refer to children who have lost their parents. But what we don't, the way, we don't use it this way in the English, but in their culture, there were instances when it described parents who lost their children. So in a way, they would be orphaned parents. And this is the message, this is the idea Paul's communicating. He's trying to communicate these deep parental feelings that, that he feels as if, as a father to them, that his family, his, his, his babies had been snatched away from him. And he's trying to express the deep pain that he's experienced by being forced to separate from them. And he makes it clear that Paul and his companions had tried very hard to go back to Thessalonica and, and that they had this intense longing to be back with the believers. He was trying to let them know, we have not abandoned you. We were forced out of town. We really, we've tried to get back to you. You're on our heart and on our mind all the time. So far from being afraid to return, Paul and Silas wanted to go back to Thess Thessalonica, which you know, which is amazing because in Philippi, they had been beaten and thrown into prison. In Thessalonica, they were facing the same thing. If they, you know, they, they, they beat Jason, who's they, who's, who's in whose house they were staying. And if they had caught them, they would have done the same thing to them. And, and yet they weren't afraid to go back. They knew that they could face that same thing again, but they were trying to go back. And Paul's inclusion of this personal emphasis, because a lot of this, he's saying we and us and our, but then he said, Certainly I, Paul, did again and again wanted to come to you. And that gave credence to what he wrote in verse 17. Um, but Paul's list of excuses for not returning to Thessal Thessalonica is a very short list. You know, you know what's on his list? He blames the devil. He said Satan blocked us. It's a very interesting phrase there. Paul could not return because Satan blocked them. Somehow, Satan had been able to keep them away more than once. That, that word block means to cut into or to break up. Or it's used to, in referring to destroying a road or a bridge or also is used to refer to uh, blocking the progress of an army. Now, what exactly blocked Paul and Silas from returning to Thessalonica? Thessalonica is unknown. Uh, some suggest that, that Jason, you know, I mentioned him a moment, moment ago. He was the, uh, the guy, the head of the synagogue. He was the one who was, in whose house they were staying. And he was sort of the, probably one of the leaders in the church there in Thessalonica. When they took him before them, uh, some people, some commentators suggest that he had promised the city authorities that the, that the missionaries would leave town and would never return. Others suggest that it was somehow related to the Jewish opposition to the apostles' mission in Thessalonica and that Paul interpreted the rioting and he interpreted the decision of the city officials as all happening under satanic influence. Others suggest that what kept him from going there was a physical issue. For example, he refers to in another place, his thorn in the flesh. Uh, but the problem is, try as we might, we simply don't know. And Paul does not tell us. All we know is that Paul had an acute sense that his freedom of movement was curtailed 
and that viewing the situation on a supernatural level, he determined that Satan was the one opposing his ministry and keeping him from going back into Thessalonica. Here's, here's, the, here's what I want to take a moment to talk about. We need to know that spiritual warfare does actually truly exist. Satan blocked him. Satan is real. He's called in the Bible the God of this age, and he's called the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And we know that Satan and God are constantly at war, which, by the way, I want to add this into this. Uh, Hollywood likes to make it look like as if, you know, God, good and evil, or God and Satan are at war with each other. And, and it's just, you're just not sure who's going to win because it's so close. And, and at the end, good barely prevails. And that's just not it at all because Satan... He, he doesn't stand a chance against God. It's not even a whisper of a chance. He has n no power compared to what the God has. Um, but, but he's still constantly and actively working to keep people from accepting Christ. He, he works to hinder God's people from doing God's kingdom work. Why, why does he work so hard at destroying humankind? It's because we we're created in the image of God. So every time he looks at us, he sees the image of his mortal enemy and he wants to do nothing but destroy us. Satan does all he can to attack the church, to attack the people of God. And he'll bring in false teaching to lead believers astray, which that's, I believe, more of a problem now than ever before because False teaching can be transmitted to so many millions of people all at once. Uh, he can d even disguise himself as an angel of light. Comes in and, and makes himself look like he's good. He, 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 will, he will attempt to hurt the community of believers in any way possible. And like I said, God is far more powerful than Satan. And sometimes he does intervene. But the truth is, he does not always do so. Now, that's a little hard for us to deal with, a little hard for us to understand. Because, you, you know, if, if God is all-powerful and Satan is, you know, this puny little thing compared to his power, now he's stronger than you and I. But, but, if, but if that's the case, then why doesn't God just say, hey, that's mine, get away from him? Well, it's because sometimes he, God wants to use the difficulties to build our character. It's like when you're working out, if you're in the gym and you're working out with weights, the, the reason you keep going heavier and heavier on the weights is because every time you lift, you're, you're, you're actually tearing up the muscle tissue. And when it heals, it heals back stronger. And so it's the resistance that makes you stronger. Uh, and sometimes God wants us, he just wants to build our character. He wants to make us stronger. Another, another reason, sometimes... He lets us walk through those things. I mean, and if you don't think he does allow it, read the book of Job. But sometimes it's because he wants to, wants to teach us to rely on him alone. And he knows that if life is easy, we're going to get feeling pretty good about ourselves and think, man, I got this all figured out. And then the other times, and this is maybe my favorite one of all, when he just wants to get us in a position where he can reveal his power. Look, look I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of that. Lazarus. Jesus waited four days before he went back to, to see his friend who was sick. Why? He told the disciples, he said, he's dead. He said, we're waiting. And, and, and the reason he delayed was because he, God wanted to put his power on display. He wanted to show what he could do. Yes, everybody already knew he could heal because Jesus had healed many, many times before that. But God wanted to put on display that he had the power to, to bring somebody back from the dead. Another, another instance, it was the man born blind, one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. And I love how that story starts because the disciples walked by this man with Jesus and they're, they're going to get into this profound theological argument or conversation anyway, maybe not an argument. But they said, Jesus, who sinned that this man was born blind, him or his parents? Because they actually believed that a baby could sin in the womb before he was born. 
and could cause and the result. They, they saw things like blindness as their d- d- direct result of sin. Uh, that if you were pleasing to God, you wouldn't have that sort of thing happen. And so they believed that a baby could be born and because he had sinned in the womb, he was born blind or his parents sinned while he was in the womb. And so therefore the result of that was this, this kid was born blind. But Jesus's response to them was neither. He, he said it has nothing to do with sin. It has nothing to do with his sin or their sin at all. He said he was born blind so that the people can see the glory of God. That's a thought there that sometimes there are bad things that happen in our life because God wants to put his glory on display in the middle of that. And the only way to put that kind of glory on display, the only way to show the glory of God that can heal a blind man is to have a blind man. Right? And so... These are some of the things, but the, 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 the thing is we have to realize that this warfare is real. And by the way, when we talk about spiritual warfare, a lot of times we think about intercession and that is a huge part of it. But I also want you to realize spiritual warfare takes place every single day in your life internally. Every time you're faced with the battle to do what you know is right or to do something that is sinful, that is a spiritual battle that is going on. That's spiritual warfare. Every time you choose to honor God and to please Him instead of honoring yourself and doing something selfish and sinful, every time you do that, you have won a spiritual battle. So it's not just about what what a lot of our modern contemporary Christianity has made it where it's all about, you know, know, doing battle in the heavenlies. (laughs) Most of it's right here between our heads. That's where the biggest battle goes on in our lives. But because this battle is there, because this warfare is real, we need to be aware of that and be vigilant and be faithful to Christ. All right. So he doesn't, I said a moment ago, Paul did not explain in any more detail what prevented him from returning, but he instead focuses on why he wants to return. And the reason has to do with eschatology, which is just a big theological word that means the last days or the last things, the end times, however you want to think of it. But verse 19, this is what he said. Four, now this is why we know this verse is connected to what he just said about wanting to return, not being able to return, uh, but being blocked by Satan. Four, what is our hope? So he's saying, referring to what he just wrote, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when He comes. All right, so now he's tying it in with the return of Christ. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So with with overflowing love for this young church, Paul asked a question and then he answered it himself. What was the joy, hope, or crown in which Paul and and Silas would be able to glory in, in the presence of the Lord Jesus? And the answer was it would be the Thessalonian believers. In other words, hope describes Paul's confidence in these believers because hope is not this, well, maybe it will, maybe I won't, I hope so. But it's a hope in the Bible is a confident expectation. He has a confident expectation that this is going to happen. The word joy pictures his own inner feelings when he will see them presented to the Lord. This is, he's picturing this moment when Christ returns and he sees the Thessalonian believers being presented to God, almost in, in a sense with him saying, look, this is, this is what my ministry, this is what faithfulness to you, this is what I'm bringing to you as a gift, Lord God. And, 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 and seeing them presented to the Lord and welcomed to the kingdom. And then the crown of which he speaks is, is not a crown of royalty, not like a king, but it's a, laurel crown uh, given to the victor in athletic races. You know, you've seen like in the old Olympics in the, uh, in the ancient Greek, Greek uh, Olympics, the winner would have this wreath of, of, of uh, leaves, this vine around him. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about a crown that they received specifically for a race. And so uh, for him, he was saying that these Thessalonian believers were like a victory crown giving Paul joy and having run the race for their sakes. And when he sees them there in the kingdom of God, when he sees them standing before Christ and accepted as 
part of the family of God, then he will know my life and all that I did was worth it. That's, that's what he's saying. And he, he, he does not want to be seen as running in vain. We're going to see it again specifically in a verse that's coming up. And for Paul, seeing these believers, the Thessalonians and others and other churches as well, is an endorsement of his ministry and his methods if he can successfully bring his converts to the end of the journey. And, th- and that's, you know, I mean, listen, I think I could probably say for any pastor, this is exactly how, how we feel that the church where we serve, that what, what our goal, what, what would bring us the greatest joy is finally reaching heaven and getting there and seeing you there and knowing that some way or another in God's grace that he used me to help you get there. That's, that's what he's talking about. And he said this all in light of the return of Jesus. And he used the, the Greek word parousia. Um, and he used it for the first time out of, out of seven times in Thessalonians, six of which refer to Jesus' second coming. But one time in 2 Thessalonians 2.9, he actually refers to the lawless one or the, the uh, uh, Antichrist. Uh, and we'll get to that when we get to it. But we, it talks about him coming. That word parousia later became the normal word to describe the return of Christ as sovereign Lord. It was a word that in their culture was applied to the arrival of some great personage, like a king or an emperor. It was, it was a usual word for a royal visit. Now Thessalonica, remember, they were, they were a, a favored city in Rome, so they would really associate this word. They would understand this word because if the emperor ever came to visit Thessalonica, that would be a parousia. So when they hear about Jesus returning and it's referred to as a parousia, they immediately get the idea of what's, what he's talking about. And, and he interprets his ministry in light of the return of Jesus. The ultimate reward for Paul's ministry was not money or prestige or fame, but new believers whose lives had been changed by God through the preaching of the gospel. Um, let, let me let just move on to verse 1. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. So here we see Paul's, he's concerned about whether uh, they're still following Christ and whether his efforts were wasted. Um, When he left, you you just know that it stirred up a, a host of emotions in Paul's heart when he had to leave suddenly. Uh, and and he, he faced his own doubts about whether he did ever make it back to Thessalonica to see these people. And he also wondered if the Thessalonians were harboring any bitterness or animosity toward him for his hasty departure. You know, maybe they were, he was afraid they were thinking that he had abandoned them. Like, man, when things finally, when they get tough, all of a sudden Paul takes off. He's really giving you a glimpse of his heart here and revealing his profound love for the, for the church But concern for the Thessalonian church caused Paul and his companions to take action, which, by the way, concern and compassion always leads to action, uh, if it's real. They decided that Paul and Silas would stay in Athens while they sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to visit the believers. Now, the word alone is plural in Greek, so we know it was Paul and Silas that we should stay here by ourselves. Uh, and so they stayed behind St. Timothy, and the word alone expresses a sense of desolation, and it has the idea of being left behind. So we get from this picture that this was a very difficult decision for him. He really, really, really wanted to go back himself, but because he could not go, uh, he, he at least could send his, his co-worker uh, for God in his place. So Timothy had three main tasks to accomplish, to strengthen the believers, 
to encourage the believers and to keep them from becoming unsettled in their, in their trials. To strengthen them meant that he would teach them and build them up in their Christian walk. The word, the word used for strengthened has the idea of, of putting in a buttress or a support. Um, and, and so Timothy was, put it this way, he was there to reinforce what the Thessalonian believers had already believed. He had the task of shoring up the faith of the believers and reassuring them of, it, of its validity. To encourage them meant that Timothy would comfort and exhort them. Uh, in fact, the word encourage here is it comes from the same word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit, parakletos, uh, the comforter. And it really literally means one called alongside to help. And then he points out and the need for constant strengthening and support. And that's essential for all of us. It's true for all of us. Uh, you know, there is a tendency, especially in the West, especially here in America, we think of the ideal individual as, you know, the Lone Ranger, you know, Rambo standing against all odds. Um, and we think that that's ideal, but that's not the Christian ideal. The Christian ideal is of needing one another. That none of us can make it alone, that we need one another. And the, the recognition of need is the beginning of health. When I understand I need you, that's when I begin to get healthy, in, spiritually speaking. In the same way that the, the recognition of weakness is the beginning of faith. See, if I think I'm strong, then I don't need faith. But when I understand I'm weak, that's when my faith can grow because then I have to trust God. Um, to, to know and accept that about each other is a basis for all Christ, growing Christian relationships. Now, Paul knew that facing trials because of one's faith should be expected. Inevitably, tribulations would come from a society opposed to the values at the core of Christianity. In fact, Paul later on, he wrote to Timothy in another place. He said, think about this. I don't know if you ever read this. He says, everyone. This a quick question. Who does everyone include? Yeah, I think it includes everyone. All of us, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Seems like we ought to expect it when it happens. And Paul wanted the believers in Thessalonica to know that the troubles that they were going through were not unusual. Indeed, they were expected. He said in verse 3, you know quite well that we were destined for them. And he's talking about these trials. Paul's just reminding the Thessalonians that suffering and persecution comes with the territory. If you decide to live for Christ, there's going to be somebody, there are going to be certain groups of people who will oppose you, who will, you know, now in our country, it's probably going to be nothing more than, than uh, mocking you and it's going to be making fun of you and that sort of thing. But there will be something that will happen. And Paul wanted to make sure that they understood that, that suffering should be expected now, some people in our Christian world in the West think that troubles are always caused by sin or are always caused by a lack of faith. Well, that's just not true. You, you, all you have to do is read the New Testament to know that that's not true. Uh, let me, I'll tell you this. This is one that gets me. Somebody comes forward and they get prayed for for healing and then they don't get healed. And, and the person who prayed for them says, oh, they just don't have enough faith. Well, what about your faith? You remember the, the, the man who was lame, who was lowered, lowered through the ceiling? It says Jesus looked at them and seeing their faith, he healed that man. What, which means that if, if, if I'm supposed to be this great man of faith saying, if you have faith, it will happen. You can make God do it. He's going to heal you if you have faith. And they come forward and, you, and I pray for them and they don't get healed. If I point the finger at them and say, oh, they just didn't have enough faith, I better realize, <laughs> I better be putting the, pointing the finger at me because I was praying, so maybe I was the one who didn't have faith. See, it's just, it's just an inconsistency. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, but experiencing problems and persecution can build character. It can build perseverance. And, and you know what? The other thing it builds, 
It also builds a sensitivity toward others who are going through things themselves. We become much more compassionate toward other people who are hurting when we have been through something that caused pain in our lives as well. Some people turn to God with the hope of escaping suffering on earth, but God never promises that. But he did promise to give us the power to go, go through and to grow through our sufferings. Um, um, because of that, we, we can't ever resent him, but, but we just have to trust him for the strength and remain faithful to him. In verse 5, we read it, but he said this, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. So Paul feared that persecution directed at this young church might be too intense and he might, it might lead the people to doubt their faith. Think of it like this. Since Satan had, re had repeatedly thwarted Paul's attempts to return to the city, it would be natural for him to assume that the tempter was also working overtime sowing seeds of fear and doubt among these baby Christians. So he sees this going on. For this reason, Paul could not stand it. I mean, you know, there were no, they didn't have cell phones. They couldn't call each other up. He didn't get texts to say, hey, we're doing great over here, having persecution, but we're standing strong. He had no idea what was going on to the church there in Thessalonica, and he couldn't stand it anymore. And in fact, that word talks about pressure building up on the outside of a, a watertight barrel. And, 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 and so he had to find out. Now, now, he talked about the tempter there. Satan the tempter is the most powerful of evil spirits. He is an angel who rebelled against God. As I said earlier, he is real. He is not symbolic. Uh, and his activities are always opposed to God and those who obey him. Um, uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead on some of these verses there for those that are running the PowerPoint. But I want to say, want to say this, because I was going to get into talking about, we're, but we're running short on time about how, you know, talk a little bit more about the spiritual warfare that we're dealt with. But knowing that we're in that, we know that we need supernatural power to defeat Satan. And God has provided us this by giving us the Holy Spirit. Uh, remember what Jesus said to Peter. I say to you, you're a Peter, and upon this rock, that the rock is his confession of faith, I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Just remember that in, the, in your battles. In that spiritual fight, remember that. Colossians 2.15, one of my favorite verses. God disarmed the evil rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by His victory over them on the cross of Christ. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? Satan's already defeated. It's, it's a done deal. This, we're just now in the process of God Oh, building his kingdom and drawing people to Christ. And when his work is done, it's done. And, and, but, but Satan can't stop it. And when we face temptation or trouble, we, we can make it through by the grace and the power of God. 1 John 4, 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Now, don't, don't skip that part. A lot of us like to quote the second half, but don't skip the submit part. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Why, why is he fleeing from you? Not because you're all big and bad, but because you've submitted to God, who is far more powerful than he is. Uh, when we face hardships that the enemy intends to use to tempt us into giving up, God can use those circumstances to help us to grow when we rely on him and his power. So be encouraged because through Christ we have victory. Now I want to close, I want to close with this. Before closing, I want to, I want to mention a specific point that I think, I think is important. Two different times in these opening verses, in these opening chapters, Paul spoke of the return of Christ. Once in Chapter 1, verse 10, once in chapter 2, verse 19. This is a theme that, that to which he's going to return in much greater detail later in, in his, these letters. 
But Jesus' coming is central to Paul's worldview. Uh, I mean, even, even though his stay in Thessalonica was very short and it was cut short, Paul apparently spent a considerable amount of time teaching the infant church about Christ's coming because they still had questions. He, he wanted them to view their present circumstances in the light of their, uh, of their future hope, to view what, what they're dealing with now in light of the fact that Jesus is returning. And as you read 1 Thessalonians, you see that despite Paul's instructions, they still had a lot of questions and a lot of concerns about Jesus' return. And we're going to get to those in coming weeks. Yet, yet even in their confusion, the imminent return of, of Christ served to remind them of three important truths. And these have significant implications for how you and I live today. So I want to give these to you. First of all, because of the promise of Christ's coming. Number one, we do not have to allow the troubles of this life to discourage us. You'll have trouble. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But we don't have to let it discourage us. Because Why? Because we know Christ will one day remove us from our troubles. In other words, it's not always going to be like this. One day, He's going to put an end to it. He's going to take us all to be with Him. Now, here's the thing. We may not be able to ignore the things that we experience in this life but we do not have to focus on them. If He's able to rescue us from the coming wrath, then surely He's able to carry us through life's tribulations now. Second truth about His coming is that he will, we will be accountable to Him when He comes. Now this is a little bit more sobering. Jesus said this in Matthew 25. You've heard this parable. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. This is a warning uh, about being ready and understand that we'll be held accountable. His imminent return is not meant to be a doctrine to confuse us or to frighten us, but it's a promise that should motivate us. When He comes, we will be accountable for what we did with Jesus and how we lived for Jesus. Paul's words of encouragement should be a call to his action repeatedly. He said in 1 Thessalonians 5, But you, brothers, are not in the dark for this day to overtake you like a thief. He's talking about the return of Christ here. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then we must not sleep like the rest, but we must stay awake and be serious. Here's the third truth about His coming. And this is, this is very down to earth, very practical. And that is, we don't have to right every wrong that is done to us. Because Jesus is coming. Because we have the promise that God, that Jesus is coming and God will exercise His righteous judgment at Christ's coming. Therefore, we don't have to right every wrong. We can leave things in the hands of God. We don't, have to, we don't have to try to get back at somebody. We don't have to carry out revenge. In fact, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That means it's His territory. If I'm trying to take vengeance, I'm trying to do God's work, and that's a pretty scary place to be. But we got to know that God is more than capable of balancing the books. 
Peter wrote that all human beings will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and dead. 1 Peter 4, 5, that's where he said that. And, and we must not forget what Paul told the Thessalonians about God's righteous judgment. He said in the- 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7, it is righteous for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to reward with rest you who are afflict- afflicted along with us. So until that day, We can just confidently entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly. 1 Peter 2.23. What does that mean? It means instead of looking for the day when we finally get revenge, we, we should just trust him and relax and wait and be longing for the day when God judges in righteousness. Because when he judges in righteousness, you know what that means? That means that when he makes the decision, all of creation will say, that's the right judgment. That is absolutely perfect. That's right. I mean, no question. We must fix our eyes eagerly toward heaven and wait for God's Son. And every day should be met with the expectation and the anticipation that this might just be the day of his return. And and that knowledge and that expectation should shape our actions, should shape our attitudes as we live our lives here on earth. You see, that means if He's coming again, then then the temporary things that I waste my time on maybe aren't as important as I think they are, and I can let some of those things go. It also means that I don't have to fight for justice for myself because He's coming, He'll take care of that. It also means that I I need to take care of my business with him now because I'm going to be held accountable. What did I do for him? How did I live? Did I I really take it seriously that he was returning? Did I really take it seriously that he wants the world to know that Jesus loves him? It changes the way we live. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord God, that in the midst of spiritual battles, that we have a hope that goes beyond that, and that is that Christ is returning. Lord, I pray that that if we're going through any kind of issues, problems, pain, trials, tribulations, whatever it might be, God, I pray that, that we would be strengthened and encouraged tonight knowing that all of these things are temporary, that Jesus is coming back. And in that moment, He will judge righteously, He will take care of all those things, all those wrongs that have been committed. He'll take care of those. But God, help us to live now in light of that return and to make sure that we're we're making ourselves accountable now to the gospel so that when you return, you'll be able to look at us and and say in all truthfulness, truthfulness, well done, good and faithful servant. We give you praise for all of it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.